Live from San Francisco, celebrating 10 years of high-tech coverage, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2019. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Well, good morning. Welcome to day three of our coverage here on theCUBE of VMworld 2019. We're in Moscone Center North here in San Francisco. Kind of a, well not kind of, it's a really cloudy day, but I kind of expect that. We've been talking about clouds all week, right? <laughs> Multi-hybrid, public, private, you name it. We've been talking about it. John Walls at Dave Vellante, good to see you this morning. See you, David. John. Yep. Uh, we're joined now by a couple of executives from uh, Caminario, uh, Josh Epstein, who's the CMO, and Ayo David, who is the CTO of Kevin Ario. And good morning, gentlemen. Good, good to morning. see you. Good morning, great to be here, great to be here. Yeah, first yeah. off, let's just talk about the show. I know you've got a presence down on the floor, uh, just your feeling about the traffic, the kind of traffic you're seeing at your booth, what the questions are coming from customers, and maybe what those answers are. Ayo, why don't you jump on that? Yeah, so, um, First of all, it's uh, great to be back in San Francisco for, for, the, for, this, for this conference this You're year. You're here. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. <laughs> and I think it's very clear that yes, definitely cloud is, is the name of the game, and especially how do you implement a hybrid cloud. Customers are all on, on their cloud journey, and the big question is how do I do that? How do I take these new technologies, the cloud containers, and how do I take my applications and my data services to the next step? and it's kind of all over the place. All the sessions, all the customers are asking about this is, this is, this is where, where the focus is, where the interest is, and um, it's, uh, it's great to be in the center of all of that. Yeah, now you made a big decision or a big announcement about a month ago. Uh, you said, okay, public cloud, that's, that's where we're going. Josh, uh, the driver behind that and, and kind of what the early fallout. Sure, there. sure, no, I mean, we, we started our, our journey um, really from the beginning of Cominar. Cominar is about 10 years old, uh, you know, into the, the, the data storage market as a traditional all-flash storage array. Uh, the past 24 months, we really pivoted the, the business model towards uh, first to 100% software, or got out of the appliance business, started really focusing our, uh, our, our business on doing these, these large software-based uh, implementations, um, moving into more subscription-based revenue, kind of delivering that, that cloud-based economics um, experience. Uh, and then over the last uh, several months, we've been focusing on taking our, our, our core architecture, which fundamentally decouples the data services from underlying infrastructure, and thinking about how that might actually look on, on public cloud. So doing the same thing, kind of creating this sort of shared storage experience, uh, doing all the traditional enterprise class data services, but sitting on public cloud infrastructure. Uh, it's been a really interesting journey. So let's double click on that, because it's clear that this, this space is not about the media, it's about the business model, it's about the additional value that you can add for customers. So maybe you could add a little bit color as to sort of how's that going, where you guys are differentiating in the marketplace, where you're, where you're winning. Sure, I mean, I yeah. think, you jump in, Neil. Yeah, so I think it's, it's, as you said, it's not about the media, it's all about how do you help customers have a uniform experience about, uh, for around any deployment model. So they want to deploy on-prem, they want to deploy in the cloud, they are actually seeking for a kind of uniform way to do that without uh, too much heavy lift. There's some challenges in going to the cloud. If you are not born in the cloud, you need to re-architect your applications, you need to kind of learn some new skills, and there's a big challenge, especially if you have big data intensive applications, and that's where we focus, delivering that uniform experience around orchestration of resources and data services across uh, your on-prem, uh, off-prem, and public cloud implementation. So, so you guys decided not to ship a box anymore, you know, the Silicon Valley show, right? where's the box? <laughs> and so, um, and, and so I'm interested in the technical challenges of doing that, but also the customer feedback, because sometimes people want an appliance, so how were you able to transition through that and what's the feedback been? Yeah, I think you know, f for us, I mean, our, our core business, our core customer has really been cloud scale applications for the last five years, right? right? So this is large uh, SaaS providers, e-commerce platforms, FinTech, health tech, kind of these, these large, mature software companies, right, that their core business is delivering a cloud scale application. And for them, um, you know, many of them were born kind of before the age of, of the public clouds, so they've actually heavily invested in, in application architectures that, that rely on enterprise class shared storage. Uh, that said, they see the draw towards the cloud. They see the, the, um, uh, the benefit of the cloud-like economics, subscription-based, consumption-based economics, and then the overall capability to scale up and scale out like, like the cloud does. But that said, they need that, that, that bridge from where they are today with traditional uh, you know, uh, um, data-centric architectures to this, this cloud world. You mentioned FinTech, and there's, there's an in interesting case, because when, when the cloud first really started to gain momentum, a lot of the financial services companies, the big guys especially, said, you know, we can build our own clouds. 
And then they realize, well, we can't build them as fast as Amazon can build them. And then so they sort of pulled back on that, but, but, and they sort of put their foot in the cloud and then went all, and then they said, wait a minute. So what are you seeing in terms of like, the, the call it the private cloud, you know, we've kind of swung back to that. Uh, uh, is that gap closing? Are they able to get sort of close enough? The key part of that is obviously the, 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 the pricing models and the pay by the drink. I wonder if you could add some color to the sort of on-prem cloud business, sure. if we can call it that. Some that's people right. might object, but that's... <laughs> yeah, definitely. Sure. So the, the way we approach it is that yeah. we want to bring the uh, simplicity, the agility, and the flexibility of the cloud model to this on-prem data center to deliver the same performance control of a dedicated resource, which is exactly what these type of FinTech customers are looking for. So in our basic architecture, which is already was decoupled from hardware and already decoupled performance from capacity, we're able to do that in extremely flexibility. You can get the same flexibility of the cloud in an on-prem solution with all the benefits, mm. and you can also decide on your own pace, in your own terms, what you actually need and make sense to run on a public cloud in, uh, infrastructure. So scale is obviously a big deal for your customers. That's kind of been your, your focus since day one. What's the bell curve look like? Are we talking about scale in terms of just the ability to, to scale quickly, or is it also just the sheer size, and what, what does it look like? In there? I, mean, I think it's, it's, big, it's about performance at scale, uh, it's about control over performance at scale, it's about control over availability at scale, and it's obviously about cost at scale, right? I mean, there's, it, it's too, there's so many different ways to look at the, the economics of public cloud versus on-prem. If you look at the pure, pure dollars, clearly building out your own dedicated on-prem infrastructure is cheaper than paying you know, Amazon or Google or, or whoever to do it. But there's clear benefits to kind of going in that direction in terms of agility, in terms of hands-off uh, management, in terms of really just, you know, staffing uh, expertise. Um, but I think it does come down to control, right? And when you talk about scale, when you talk about petabyte scale, you know, it's, it's easy to lose control. And this is the benefit of, of shared storage models and this is where we think there's a, a real opportunity. Can, can I follow yeah. up on that? Because you said there's a clear benefit of, if I understood it correctly, of, of building out your on-prem infrastructure at some, at some critical mass. Right. There's obviously people that, you know, like Andy Jassy would disagree with that. So, so what's your data showing? Um, I presume it's weighted toward large customers. Absolutely. Right? But maybe you could add some color to that. Yeah, we've done that some state. good good research uh, and good analysis on this. I think if you're talking about, uh, you know, give, we're talking about certainly over 500 terabytes to a petabyte, to multi-petabyte scale, uh -huh. data-driven applications. We're talking about business critical applications, big block storage, heavy analytics. If you compare just raw economics, right? And a, the thing is, there's a lot more than just the raw economics, but the raw economics of, uh, of an infrastructure built on Cominario versus an equivalent infrastructure built on one of the block storage um, uh, resources from one of the public clouds, it's about, about literally about one third the cost to build out that, that your own dedicated infrastructure, leveraging a you know, good high quality colo, good high quality hardware underneath it. Um, so raw economics, it's clear uh, where, where that sits. Okay, so that's, we're, we're comparing the, 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 the cost of the, the acquisition cost versus the sort of some end number of years, right? Uh, that's correct. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and not, not really going into the, the labor cost at that? At the not point. going into the, not going, I mean, into the direct labor cost of managing the storage, yes. There's clearly interesting benefits to going to 100% cloud model. What, what that does to an organization when you kind of hands off, you, you know, you don't have the same kind of in-house IT resources, you're outsourcing a lot of that. Um, well, except what Eo was saying before, is you're trying to bring that cloud model to, right, to, so to, the, to, the, to the, the data, thing, the so to the extent that you can close that gap, then you can substantially mimic. Exactly. We, we saw the opportunity to extend those capabilities into the public cloud. Right. Delivering a high performance storage solution in the cloud today is, is, is expensive. We uh, are focused over the years of taking these commodity components and comprising them into a high performance shared storage solution. We can do the same in the cloud. We take but, but I think the key is multi-cloud, right? Yep. The key is that there's yeah, not one, that. one size fits all, and it really is about creating this mobility between your on-prem data and public cloud number one, and then public cloud number two. One of the key concerns about moving a business critical application to a public cloud is lock-in. Right, and if you can create this, this infrastructure, you're decoupling that, that, that data services stack that the application relies on from the underlying infrastructure. You get this mobility between clouds that becomes really attractive. So you're kind of answering, I guess the question that was on my mind, is how are you selling that to customers? I mean, the fact that we're having this very robust discussion about this fundamental shift, mm -hmm. and, and you get it because 
you're, you're kind of providing this service to right. your whole client base, but if I'm a client, my head's starting to spin a little bit, right? And I've got big decisions to make. So how do you sell that, that this is not a little shift, this is a fundamental way in the way you're going to do your business? So, so in, this, in its simplest form, we tell the customer that we significantly lower the barrier of entry into the cloud. You don't need to re-architect everything. You don't need to be worried about performance management or uh, control or orchestrating resources. We do all that for you and we do that in the same way that we did it for you on, on your own on-prem data center and we can do it on any of the public clouds. So the barrier of entry, the risk of actually doing that transition lowered, is right. lowered significantly yeah. and you can do that on your own pace in your own terms and make some smart decisions later on about where what needs to reside where over time. So when we think about multi-cloud, we think about, okay, I, I, I'm going to have data on-prem, I, I might choose uh, Azure for my collaborative workloads, I might put my dev stuff in AWS, I might put some analytics in Google, you know, whatever. My business is going to decide what to do. I don't, I'm not going to have this grand multi-cloud strategy, it's just kind of going to happen. And then I'm going to be, <laughs> then, then IT's going to be called in to clean up the crime scene. Right. But so, uh, but we're envisioning this architecture that's shipping metadata and maybe compute to the data versus moving data. Do you agree with that um, um, do you, or do you see it differently? We, we see, I think, two types of customers. Some behave just as you described, but some have a very specific decision not to be locked into a single vendor. So they'll say, I'll put, I'll put one business unit on Google Cloud and I'll put the other business unit on Azure. I'll put this certain type of applications on one cloud and the other type on the, on the other cloud because I want to make sure that I am cloud agnostic. I'm actually mandating within the organization that I can run, that I can run anywhere. As and a hedge. As, as a hedge, yeah. as a definite hedge because they're concerned about locking to either of the vendors. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, um, they, they later on make the decision, okay, where is the kind of, where is the core of the data? Where is my mission critical data, which always has some gravity and how do I make sure that it's in the right place at the right time? But that, doesn't that add the uh, complexity for the client? I mean, if, if, they, if they've got a workload here and here and here, it'd be a lot easier if it were all here or most of it were here. But that adds, I, I mean, I just said, I'm wondering You're if You're absolutely that right, but you, what we see is this, this rapid shift towards this, this embracing the multi-cloud model. So let's just take an example. You know, you have a, a classic cloud scale application. They might have an active active data centers in two parts of the United States, sort of serving up their production application. You have dev test requirements, right? So they, they want the ability to rapidly spin up an environment to, to mimic a problem or do some development. Public Cloud's a great example for that. You have DR requirements or backup requirements. They want to be backing up, they want the ability to rapidly spin up an instance um, in, in a public cloud instance. And no matter what, you know, in every organization somewhere, even in the most sophisticated uh, IT organizations where they have tremendous control over the data centers, there is some C-level exec somewhere that says like, in five years, I'm 100% public cloud. I want no, I want, I want nothing, right? So you have to sort of service that, that, that audience as well. And what we're doing is it's saying, listen, you can continue to focus on building out a world-class next generation data center based on the you know, NVMe, all NVMe fabric, um, and still have the ability to do certain things in the cloud and still have this path, if, if it makes sense for your organization, to migrate the entire thing to public cloud and not get locked in, to be able to sort of surf the clouds as it actually... As it, so as technically, it. that means you have to speak Azure, API, S3, or whatever you, you know, yep. uh, language of the cloud. And, 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 and so, I, I'm trying to understand sort of technically what you have to do and then where you where you add value, where you pick up from, you know, whatever, VMware or whomever else is, is trying to be the, you know, the control plane. So, that's, and, so that, and that is exactly the point, and to address the question about how, okay, what the complexity of this multi-cloud world, this is exactly where the, we see kind of the rise of this next generation orchestration framework, either from VMware or from others, yeah. that strive to give you this uniform uh, experience. So we deliver that at the data services layer, we connect that to the orchestration layer that allows you to do seamless workload mobility, seamless, seamless data mobility, to wherever it makes sense for that, those applications or business, uh, or business workloads to run. And basically the customers expect today that we encapsulate all that complexity for them. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to put their Google, Amazon, or Azure credentials and then forget exactly where it runs. And th this, is, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a lot of what's going on in the floor, right, this week. And, and that's exactly where we connect to the rest of that orchestration scene within the data center or the public cloud. So in, in that context, are you primarily, I know you sell to a lot of different people, but is it the cloud architect or the, the architect that's actually 
determining that throughout the organization, or, or, or is it, again, cleaning up the crime scene kind of thing? It's, it's, it's usually a conversation with that CIO who's yeah. kind of on that cloud journey, building his cloud strategy, and even if he made it, the decision was made to in five years be on the cloud, and as the question is, okay, what's, what's happening in the meantime? How do I actually do that? And one of the core things that's happening in the meantime is most of our customers are in this perpetual state of data center consolidation, right? Most of these large SaaS companies, they're growing through acquisition, they've got nine data centers, they all have a plan within you know, two or three years to be consolidated on you know, three next generation data centers and then have cloud mobility. And so what we're able to do, this is leveraging our, our software model as well, is say, listen, let's do an enterprise-wide kind of unified licensing scheme where you're paying on consumption based on, on actual uh, data stored, and then you can build the underlying infrastructure wherever you want, right? You can base it on you know, your traditional um, infrastructure you might already own, it might be on next generation NVMe, NVMe over fabric connected data centers, and then a piece of it now might be in the public cloud. So, you're talking CIO, Dave, you're talking CSI. I'm just a little confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for the time. We, we appreciate it, great discussion, and uh, continued success downstairs and on down the road. Great Thank to be you. here, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Thank back with more us. VMworld 2019 here on theCUBE. Thank <laughs> you.